said, sometimes by us, that their influence is unhappily receding. Just recently, last spring, our Student Advisory Committee sponsored a panel on the future of the Democratic Party, and this fall, one on the future of the Republican Party. And last July 11th, Frank Ferenkopf, chairman of the Republican National Committee, spoke at this forum on the Republicans after Reagan. Tonight, October 3rd, we have the chairman of the Democratic National Committee to speak on the Democrats after Reagan. Paul Kirk is an old friend. He graduated from Harvard College and the Harvard Law School. He has lectured at Institute of Politics student study groups and helped us author a book on presidential campaign decision-making in 1980. He is an attorney. He served as special assistant to Senator Edward Kennedy from 1971 to 77, and he was national political director of the Kennedy for President Committee in 79 and 80. He was treasurer of the DNC from 83 to 85, and early this year, he was named chairman of the Democratic National Committee. Last June, Paul participated in a panel discussion on the state of the two-party system during the 25th reunion of his Harvard class. On that occasion, he was characteristically low-key, no hype, clear, sensible, informative. Perhaps he was also constrained by the excessive familiarity of one's college classmates and the requirement to talk about a bipartisan system. Tonight, he faces a more sophisticated political audience, <laughs> juices flowing, gloves off, and he's also been at his job a little longer. Whether as a political analyst or a political warrior, or both, I am grateful to welcome Paul Kirk back tonight. Thank you all very much for a warm welcome, and Jonathan, to you for your kind introduction and introducing me uh, back at a school named after a gentleman who probably inspired me to a great degree to get involved in political activity and, and public life. Uh, see some classmates out there who felt the same way in our day, and I hope that as we go about our business that the students who are here at the Kennedy School and at other colleges throughout the country will think in the days ahead of the Democratic Party and what it stands for in the future as we did and why we're still so proud to be working for it. Uh, Jonathan mentioned uh, that some eight months ago I was elected chairman of the Democratic Party of the United States. What he didn't tell you was that uh, the Democratic Party has a brand new headquarters. And when I walked in the first day as chairman of the Democratic Party, got a nice office there that overlooks Amtrak, uh, there by the chairman's desk was a big floral arrangement. And I walked up and I saw a card on the floral arrangement and I picked it up and it said, rest in peace, Jonathan Moore. And I thought to myself, I remember that Jonathan had some uh, Republican background, but I thought, that is not like Jonathan, the old pal from the Kennedy School. And frankly, I was a little bit uh, indignant about it, because I thought he was going to send me a message about the state of the Democratic Party and where we were going from here. And I thought about uh, calling him up and raising hell, and I thought, well, let me take a look at this card. And I saw up in the corner of the card, there was a, uh, a flower shop here at uh, Harvard Square. So before uh, raising hell with Jonathan, I called up the flower shop and I identified myself, told the folks who I was, and I said, I just uh, been elected chairman of the party. I received this card, and uh, frankly, I'm quite indignant about it. And the guy said, well, wait a second. Let me just go and check the books, can I? So he went, left the phone, and he came back, and he said, Mr. Kirk? Yeah. He said, there's been some mistake. And I said, well, I would hope so. <laughs> but he said, uh, you think you feel bad. 
He said, somewhere over in Mount Auburn Cemetery, <laughs> by a tombstone, there's a floral arrangement. And on that floral arrangement, it says, you've got a tough road ahead. Best of luck from your new location. <laughs> Now, that probably leads me to a parallel I could describe about what was said about the uh, Republican Party some years ago, 1964, when all the pundits and all the uh, cartoonists said it's over for the Republican Party. They're drawing tomb tombstones on the cartoons, and commentators were saying the crepe is on the door. And some might say that the uh, landslide election of 1984 uh, it was very similar to that of 1964. Well, I'll tell you one similarity that is clear. In my view, the pundits who were prepared to bury the Democratic Party in 1985 is as wrong, are as wrong as they were about the Republican Party in 1965. That's fine. <laughs> this is, we've got to have some partisans in the audience. Uh, I say that really for a number of reasons. I think there are events taking place in both parties that uh, belie some of the glib assumptions that you may have read in recent months about the uh, Republican Party and the Democratic Party. And I'd suggest it's time to reassess some of those assumptions and look really at what is happening. And I'd like to start first, if I may, for a few brief, brief moments about the Democratic Party. We. Uh, quite frankly, were brought to our knees in, in 1984, four out of the last five presidential elections we've lost. I like to believe as a result of those losses, the Democratic Party in 1985 has also been brought to its senses. The challenges that I face and the Democratic Party face, I think, seize the opportunity of really what was a tough defeat at the top to start the rebuilding and to set have to be the conditions for victory in the future. We have, in the early months, move, tried to move to reshape and make some symbolic changes to perhaps shed some of the images that cost us at the polls in the past. We're trying to get our house in order. We're calling for self-discipline, for mutual trust among the many groups that have been so supportive of the party in the past. I happen to believe that uh, the American people are more apt to entrust to a political party the right to govern their business when that political party demonstrates the toughness to govern its own business. And so with that in mind, we started off in the early weeks of the National Committee under my chairmanship to do some things that frankly caused some consternation and anxiety in our ranks. One of the things that we did was to de-emphasize the importance of the caucuses of the Democratic National Committee. We did that not because we can win by turning our backs on the minorities or the groups that make up those caucuses. It's my belief that we will never be a majority party if we abandon or turn our backs on those constituencies. But the truth is that most Americans don't belong to organized caucuses. And I don't believe if we're going to broaden our base as a party, we want them to feel any less important to the Democratic Party than they are, and we need them. The next thing that happened, I made a suggestion to those groups that have been uh, so supportive of our party in an organized fashion, and asked that they consider delaying in 1987 their preliminary and perhaps premature endorsements of a particular candidate. I think candidates in this day and age must go out and build their own broad base and demonstrate their broad appeal to the American people rather than going necessarily one by one to particular groups and responding to their own agenda. If we really are going to broaden our base, we have to speak to the larger audience with a national message, never losing sight of the support groups that make up our party, but dealing with them when they can really come and force us and help us with all their resources when we get to the main event. The other thing that we uh, have done is there's a Fairness Commission manda mandated by the 1984 convention to examine, once again, the rules of the nominating process. My belief happens to be that the American people 
deserve to hear more about the vision of the party's future than to listen to uh, squabbles about its rules. So we put that on a fast track, low key operation with the Fairness Commission's rules to be reported to the National Committee in early 1986, well in advance of the 1986 elections. And hopefully it'll be free of controversy. All candidates will have input to the process. No candidate will dictate the process. We also uh, abolished the party's midterm conference. And the reason for that were basically three. One is that uh, it cost the party $2 million. The second is that very often the focus and attention on the midterm conferences have been on issues that are narrow, singular, and frankly divisive. And the media focuses attention on it, and I think a lot of people are, uh, have been disappointed in the past. Finally, uh, to use the parlance of the trade, they have been too often the preliminary or premature cattle show, or parade to the post, if you will, of the presidential aspirants of 1988 in this instance. Many people believe, and I think I share that view, that that campaign trail starts too early, and that we really, as a party, the need to do in 1986 is to win back the United States Senate, and that's where the focus should be. And I, for one, would been much rather be a chairman who'd be proud to win the midterm elections than to uh, try and exercise damage control at a midterm conference. So that was the thinking on that. Finally, one of the things that we did to bring the elected officials from around the country, 34 out of the 50 governors are Democrats, two-thirds of the House of Representatives are Democrats. We have, uh, despite the elections of 84, we won two seats in the United States Senate, two to one in the mayors around the country, all winning elections as Democrats. But the truth is, in the last few elections, some of those Democrats in some regions of the country have either been running away from the National Party or, to win, or frankly, in some instances, running against it. Now, if George Bush were here, he'd tell you that's voodoo politics. And he'd be right, and one of the things we want to do is change that and make the National Party much more of an asset and less than a burden, less of a burden to Democrats here in uh, all regions of the country where we must broaden our base. Were those uh, decisions so obvious to be described as uh, easy? Not so. Certainly not in the Democratic Party, but I think uh, this is an area where we, politics is a series of tough political choices. And uh, the folks who have had to give up a little bit have done it, perhaps not enthusiastically, but understanding the importance of victory. And that, to me, uh, gives me a great deal of hope about the spirit and the kind of unity that we can, as a national party, bring ourselves, pull ourselves together in the days ahead. Uh, some of you may say, well, this is all so much inside baseball, and what difference does it make? And, uh, but I happen to believe that if we win some political respect in terms of how we uh, conduct ourselves and how we appear as a national party prepared to work together, to reach out, to broaden our base, we can win more respect as we deal with the more substantive and important issues on which people vote. And I'll talk about those issues in a minute, but I just want to flip the channel now and talk about some of the events that are taking place in the Republican Party. Uh, no one denies the popularity of Ronald Reagan. He has been, and uh, perhaps is today, the embodiment of the Republican Party in the 1980s. But uh, Jonathan mentioned the uh, title of this uh, symposium, Democrats after Reagan. I'm going to suggest tonight <clears throat> that less than a year into the administration of Ronald Reagan, his second term, that we are at the beginning of the post-Reagan era. I see the afterglow of the November election fading. The talk of re realignment is shifting to political reality. And the triumphs of November of 1984 are being replaced by troubles in the Republican ranks. A few examples. Uh, trying to ride the momentum with, for all of that it was worth in August in the first congressional district of Texas. The Republican Party recruited an all-American football player. They spent a million and a half dollars, twice as much as the Democrats. They threw the weight, the weight of the White House behind the candidate and all the resources of the Republican National Committee and the candidate was stopped dead in his tracks by the Democrats. The hemorrhaging of realignment ended, I believe, with that victory. 
The Republicans also got themselves involved in an operation called Operation Open Door. They spent a million dollars in four states, targeted states, in the South and elsewhere to move uh, Democratic registrants over the side to the Republican side. When it was all over, it was really proved to be uh, a transparent public relations gimmick. It cost them a million dollars and a red face, and the chairman of the Democratic Party was not uh, too gleeful, but delighted with the results that fell as short as they did. You know, in the White House staff, the smooth communication and political team of Jim Baker and Mike Deaver are gone, and now you have a situation where uh, Donald Reagan and Pat Buchanan are barely talking to one, on the, one another, and I think the results have shown and some of the things that emanate from the White House in recent days. But most importantly, when I speak of the post-Reagan era, is the fact that Democratic, uh, excuse me, Republican senators who were swept into office on the coattails of Ronald Reagan's popularity in 1980 are running from his policies in 1985. Steve Sims of Idaho, Senator Abner, Senator Andrews, Paula Hawkins of Florida, Grassley of Iowa, all trying to put as much distance as they can between the man who brought them to office and the incumbent who's now there, whose policies they cannot win on in re-election in 1986. Joe Lewis said, they can run from them, but they can't hide. And the fact is, my friends, as you look at what's ahead, those Republican candidates and others who are going to carry that standard in 1986 cannot run from $200 billion deficits under an administration that promised to balance the budget within the first four years of the administration. They cannot run from the fact that the United States, from the, for the first time since World War I, is a debtor nation. Two trillion dollars in national debt doubled on the Republican administration. Larger than any debt in all of our history from a party that promises us national and economic security. A trade deficit of $150 billion exporting our industrial as well as our informational and technological base from the same party that said we'll stand up for America. There's going to be a heavy and heated dialogue in 1986 and it's beginning already. All of these things that have accumulated are accumulated under an administration that said America is back. Well, I say that it's small wonder that Paul Laxalt of Nevada, Charles Mathias of Maryland, John East of North Carolina, incumbent United States Republican senators have decided to retire because the fight of 1986 under the Republican administration is not a fight worth making nor winning as far as their calculation is concerned. Those are some of the elements. The other things that are happening only 10 months into the administration of the second term of Ronald Reagan are these. There is already a crowded campaign trail. George Bush, Howard Baker, Bob Dole, Jack Kemp. Already they've been to Michigan, where, by the way, within this coming year, the first delegates to the 1988 Republican election, Republican convention, will be selected. Even cabinet secretaries are choosing upsides, and I think the straw polls will begin very soon, and you will see the media visiting their attention on the divisions that will exist within that party and all the attention that that will bring will underscore what my belief is that even the fundamental and overwhelming choice in 1984 as a political matter as we move forward is going to be increasingly irrelevant in 1985 and 1986. In addition, there is, as you know, in the Republican Party, some individuals like Jesse Helms, Jerry Falwell, who will be imposing upon candidates some uh, litmus tests, if you will. We've had them in our own party. But finally, we're going to see within that party some uh, ide ideological purity tests imposed on their side and all the things that have been the tradition of cohesiveness within the Republican Party, I believe, will see uh, splintering. Uh, 
When I was elected chairman, there were a lot of people who gave me a lot of advice. Most of it was welcome. Some said that the way the Democratic Party is going to succeed, and the, perhaps the only way, is to become more like the Republican Party. Let me tell you, my friends, the last thing this country needs is two Republican parties. <laughs> and I want to give you some recent examples. Consider, if you will, the much publicized fall offensive we read about during the summer. The President, the Republican Senate is coming back to town with guns blazing. Within that fall offensive, if the Republican Party was left to their own devices and the Democratic voices were not heard, consider where we'd be. On the farm policy question, rural depressions, farm foreclosures, bankruptcies, family tragedies, and no heart for the heartland of America from the Republican Party. But the truth is, the Democrat, Democratic voices were heard, they seized the agenda, and they brought the Republicans back to the table to work out a farm policy to give some hope to middle American economy. And that will pay dividends in 1986 for the Re Democratic Party because they said wrong to the Republicans. Consider the trade issue. $150 billion deficits in trade. An overvalued dollar. $200 billion budget deficits. And basic indifference from the Republican Party. The Democratic Party said no. It's not that this is a debate between the fallacies of free trade or the perils of protectionism. It's a battle by the Democratic Party to say that in 1985 there is no trade policy and there must be. We're living in a global economy with in interdependent nations. And we have to have a trade policy and we'll better work on it. And the Democratic Party is committed to see that that happens and that the competition be fair and that we protect what we have to protect ourselves from a re an administration that had no trade policy. On the question of South Africa, the Republican Party basically condoned the racism and repression that is apartheid. And the Democratic voices said wrong. And they seized the agenda on that issue and they forced the Republicans to abandon the hypocrisy of the policy of constructive engagement. And even on defense, there's always the question, should there be more dollars spent or less? What the Democrats have been saying in recent days is not how many dollars, but are the dollars that spent, are they sound and they sure, and are they sure with respect to our defense system? I think the country ought to be thankful that there aren't two Republican parties, that the one Republican party that there is is not left on its own, and the Democrats are there to call the tune. I happen to believe that in the days ahead, the initiative will stay with the Democrats. I think also that the Democrats have to be, in the days ahead, policy entrepreneurs, as they were in days gone by when they've been so proud of the force of progress of change that Democrats have brought to our country and to our society. We have to move into the future, unafraid of change, willing to seek new approaches and new directions, leading the, the debate on the relevance of what government is and what it means in the society we'll face in the days ahead. Democrats clearly must connect with the younger generation and be able to frame and shape policies that provide opportunity and hope and confidence. Kinds of confidence and hope that were given to my generation by John Kennedy and by generations earlier by Franklin Roosevelt.
That doesn't mean that the policies we adopt in the days ahead need be the policies of the new frontier or even the New Deal. But the challenge, I think, as the post-Reagan era has, is beginning, is to live up to that heritage so that all of us who want the two-party system to be strong, for those of us who are Democrats, who believe in that system and believe in that party, to be once again proud of ourselves, proud of our party, and proud of our country. Thank you very much. I hope that uh, I'm glad to respond to whatever questions and that the. Uh, We're very happy that Paul Kirk will take questions. And if I may ask you, as is our practice here at the forum, if you could address your questions from the microphones on either side of the hall, and there are also microphones at the railings in the two upper decks. And and Paul will will uh, take the questions directly. Okay. Do you have a question? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kirk, I wondered if you would explain your motivations for forming the National Policy Council and what the effects of Governor Babbitt and Governor Robb's National Leadership Council uh, will have. On the first point of the Policy Commission, I uh, was troubled by the fact, as I mentioned just briefly in my remarks, that we, the, uh, na the Democratic Party does very well in the uh, state and local elections throughout the country. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the areas of the country where we've done very poorly at the national level, in the West, for instance, there are 10 Democratic governors in the 13 states. In the South, there are 10 Democratic governors in those 13 states, and we do well at all the other offices, and frankly, we get blown away at the national level. And I, I, I like to believe that if we can bring those kinds of public officials to the table of the national party and share with them and learn from them some of the things that they're able to do to better connect with those constituencies, there will be a stronger party, not writing off any region, not taking any region for granted, and uh, having a better uh, rapport and response as a national party with their constituents. And uh, I think it'll serve us well. It's, uh, it's a body that will uh, try to highlight some of the things that those Democrats have done, and also will give us an opportunity to uh, present to the American people the kinds of talent that exists within the ranks of elected officials around the country. I hope its work will be completed prior to the 1986 elections so that its uh, final product will be able to set some examples, set a tone, and uh, perhaps set a foundation from which other candidates running as Democrats in 1986 can embark and establish some uh, trails to victory. The uh, question and mentioned uh, Governor Babbitt uh, and uh, Governor Robb at the uh, about the moment of my election the uh, there was a group of elected officials who formed what's known as a Democratic Leadership Council made up of uh, principally members of the Congress some governors uh, and uh, I'd say predominantly folks from the uh, western or southern states in this country uh, Bruce Babbitt the governor of uh, Arizona is a member, however, of our policy commission. The other co-chair of that uh, Democratic Leadership Council is Dick Gebhardt, congressman from uh, Missouri, a chairman of the Democratic House Caucus, and is a member of our policy commission. I, uh, certainly from my point of view, once that body was formed and uh, they decided to uh, follow their own path, it made no sense for me to indulge or engage in any combat with them. Uh, the, li the last thing they need is two Republican parties, but the other thing we don't need is two Repu uh, Democratic parties. So uh, <clears throat> I've been working on uh, close cooperation with them, and uh, we are going to be able to share a lot of the work that they do, and I have every reason to believe that it'll be two groups working on a parallel track for a while, but I would hope that we'd be able to fold things together uh, prior to the 1986 election, and if we do, I think it would be uh, you know, a fairly significant political message of the party uh, coming together. 
You then don't foresee it continuing past 86 to, say, develop a platform for the party or issues for the party? I'm not exactly sure what they have in mind for their own uh, lifespan. They are, obviously, some of them are up for election in 1986. Some well, may well aspire to other offices in 1988. But uh, I think around the time of the 1986 election, we'll pro we'd be folding in together. I hope so. Uh, there was a gentleman over here. Mr. Kirk, uh, following up on the Western aspect of the earlier question, uh, depending on where you draw the lines, down from uh, Montana down to uh, Mexico or the Dakotas uh, down to and through Texas, the West has anywhere from 111 to 166 electoral votes. As you stated earlier, uh, four out of the last five elections, uh, the, uh, the party lost overwhelmingly and overwhelmingly in the sense of the West. What precisely is the Democratic Party going to do to crack the West? Kurt Gans was here the other day and said the battleground in the next presidential election is really going to be in the West. Well, <clears throat> the, uh, I think the combination of the South and the West is really where we need to be reaching. I think the economic growth, growth and demographic growth and the trends and figures show that uh, the base at which we sit, the traditional base of the Northeast, is shrinking. Clearly, under the uh, uh, reapportionment in 1990, there'd be some 16 seats moving from our area of the country to the southern and western states. Uh, we cannot be blind to that, and we have to take steps to try and send signals and connect with those regions of the country as a national party. Initially, uh, for the reason that you mentioned, as chairman of the Democratic National Committee, I, the first signal that I wanted to send to the West and its importance was that there would be a voice of importance from the West at the table of the National Party. With that in mind, I selected Governor Scott Matheson of Utah, who's uh, a governor who served three terms out there in a state that's been supportive of Ronald Reagan more and by greater degrees than any state in the Union, and has been uh, chief executive. All, as a matter of fact, all the public officials who wanted to see a former public official named chairman of the Democratic Party in order to send a similar kind of signal, Scott Matheson was their choice. He uh, was wiser than I. He decided that's not for me and chose not to seek the chairmanship. But he was willing to take on this responsibility, and that's a first step. The other thing, I think, too, is to uh, be working, I think, much more closely with the people and public officials from those regions. And then I think uh, you'd have to wait and see in the formulation of the ticket in 1988 whether there's going to be some kind of a balance that's uh, affected for our geography's sake and what that may mean in terms of a favorite son or daughter from a region that uh, is in the south or the west. But uh, in addition, uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, the governors and others who are coming closer to the National Party I think can help shape us and focus our direction in the states where we need to uh, be paying more attention. Uh, so go, go upstairs for one. Yeah. Is the mic on? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I appreciated much of what you said, but in all candor, I, in listening to you, um, some, and much of what you said reminded me of some of the speeches that Walter Mondale made <laughs> over the last year, and for which he was criticized. And one thing in particular was the strain of negative, the feeling that you were bringing up the trade deficit, the balance of payments, all of which is absolutely right, but which the American people aren't buying into. And what I want to know is, uh, you didn't get me excited. <laughs> and, I <w> and I want to get excited. <laughs> and uh, I want to know. <laughs> I want to know what concrete steps you're taking to first wrestle internally with the hard problems that you're dealing with, that we all have to deal with. And then secondly, once you've wrestled with them and tried to define some alternative vision, what steps you're taking to market and project a vision, something that people will be willing to give money to, so you won't have to be so dependent on a handful of big buck people but can go to and get lots of small dollars and what's going to mobilize volunteers. And I need to know in some concrete sense once you're doing to project something positive. Okay, the, uh, thank you. 
just on, on the first point, I would mention that uh, it may may have sounded uh, negative about the, what the realities of life are, but in terms of the political opportunities for starting to win the momentum of the Democratic Party and winning back the Senate in 1986, which I think is a uh, with every day that goes by, a more increasing possibility, if not a near certainty. The fact that, as I mentioned, that some of those who have been uh, beneficiaries of Reagan's popularity in his own party are running away from him, I think uh, that people are paying attention and that those Republicans are responding by putting distance between uh, those policies and his. On the, on the other question of really being able to uh, shape and be able to say to you today or tonight or this evening, that this is the uh, final answer and the final vision of the Democratic Party. Uh, I regret that I can't bring you that, and I regret to say that it is as complex as you imply that it is, and we are wrestling with those issues. The, uh, I think uh, as we look ahead, and we've done some, first of all, what are we doing? We have invested in uh, some very intensive uh, focus group research with uh, folks of uh, your age and younger and people around the country to really read and reflect and see what we can learn from their attitudes and what their needs are. There's, uh, the one thing that I'm sure of is that uh, we're not going to be able to do it by just staying within the so-called Washington Beltway. That the, the Democratic Party has to indulge and undertake an exercise, especially after 1984, to listen more closely to the American people. That's one internal uh, effort that we're taking to learn from that. The other thing is uh, that we're underway is this policy commission that I mentioned, which is largely public officials, but which are, will also have the input of private sector and people in, the, uh, in private life who are, I think, as well equipped as any to bring us some ideas and new vision and new uh, philosophy about where we're going to be in terms of the economic security questions of the future. And if there's one thing that is clear in the preliminary findings of our focus group research, it really is the fundamental questions as they've always been, is opportunity and economic security and hope for all peoples, not just the so-called uh, yuppies or whatever you will. I don't believe there's anybody in any part of the country that doesn't have an upwardly mobile spirit and wants to improve his or her own life and better the society for, for all of us. So there are some uh, preliminary things underway. I think if I uh, was able to say to you that the magic wand came in here this evening with uh, the chairman of the Democratic Party, uh, you wouldn't believe it, I wouldn't believe it, and there is some hard intellectual homework to be done. We're living in a time of very rapid change, politically, technologically, and every other way, and uh, really trying to call on the best minds and ideas that we can to really uh, forge a direction that will excite you and will bring others to the standard and uh, get people involved in the process. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Mr. Kirk, I'd like to get back to the 1986 Senate races for a minute. First of all, what are you doing to encourage people like Lessa Coyne and Byron Dorgan to challenge Republican senators who might otherwise be unbeatable? And secondly, looking at recent results in states like Nevada and Pennsylvania, Democratic senatorial candidates have been very poor for maybe the past decade. And how is 1986 going to be any different? I think, uh, first of all, I have talked with uh, Byron Dorgan, North Dakota, whose polls show that he's well ahead of the incumbent. Uh, and we're trying from the National Committee, the Senatorial Campaign Committee, any number of uh, senators and House colleagues to try to convince Byron to get in the race this time. I think uh, one of the things he's held back a little bit on is that unfortunately you may feel that the opportunities for him may be somewhat greater in 1988 on the assumption that perhaps Quentin Burdick will not run. But uh, Nevada, uh, I think with Paul Laxall stepping aside, we have a real shot at that and uh, Congressman Harry Reid who's gone to the plate will be a great candidate and is going to get important backing from the campaign committees and I think that's winnable. In Pennsylvania, there are now, as I understand it, uh, two and possibly three Senate candidates. Uh, I know Bob, uh, Bob Edgar is a candidate. Bill Green is thinking about it. And uh, there may be uh, one or two others. 
there may, as I understand it, also be a serious uh, primary on the Republican side with Governor Thornburg and Senator Specter, which uh, we uh, on the Democratic side of the aisle welcome a little squabble on the opposition side just to keep things honest. So I think uh, that's an opportunity as well. But I look uh, really with, uh, and, and Senator Mathias stepped out, I think that was a blow to the uh, Republican Party. Clearly, in the farm belt where the problems exist, I think there are real opportunities. I mentioned in my remarks, I think uh, Governor Graham will be able to win in Florida. We have uh, only four Senate seats to gain, and the Democrats will gain the majority. And I think at that point, with, with all that's at stake in terms of the possible uh, Republican and Reagan appointees to the Supreme Court in the United States, to, have, to win back the Senate of the United States and to give us the momentum we need looking ahead to 1988 is a real, uh, real opportunity that, frankly, uh, some months ago, I would have said was uh, much less. So we're, we're upbeat about it. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Chairman, regarding to the Democratic Party, it might be true what you just said. However, I believe that you are a little too optimistic about 88. 86 should be uh, in the way that the Democratic Party wants. Uh, you, however, avoid carefully the political affair of the United States and the way the Democratic Party uh, will address it. And you just mentioned the President Roosevelt, who destroyed the uh, Nazi regime and created an empire communism system that has enslaved over 37 nations. And the Democratic Party each time supported or didn't say anything. I think you are aware that United States population more and more is involved in the external affair and one, uh, its vote is based not only on domest domestic issues, but in political affairs too. How the Democratic Party intend to address this based on your conference on this night where you mentioned only South Africa and you didn't say one word about Afghanistan where the 5,000 people are killed daily? Uh, I think the uh, Democratic Party, uh, obviously, has a responsibility to uh, be sensitive to and enlightened about and forthright about its foreign policy. I don't uh, profess to be one who will come here with answers that would uh, respond to all the the, the uh, sensitivities that uh, you've brought with your question. I mentioned South Africa in the context of the fall offensive to give the audience and others some idea where I think uh, the Democrats in the last several months have seized the initiative on some of these issues. But uh, I do think that uh, the Democratic Party's history on foreign policy is something that they can, uh, people will reflect on, make judgments about, and the candidates will be asked about when the candidates for 1988 come and uh, look to you folks and others for support and your votes. That's what our process is about, whether it's questions of uh, where, how we view the uh, satellite countries and, or how we view the issues in Afghanistan or how we view the issues in South Africa or Northern Ireland or whatever it may be. But uh, I think uh, those kinds of questions questions at least at this time, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, want to really get into all the foreign policies uh, and innuendos because I think, to be perfectly frank, you're not going to find the chairman of a national party answering all those questions. What I'm, my job basically is to modernize and bring our system uh, where we can be more competitive with the other uh, party in terms of how we deliver our message. There are those who, who will come here and debate and talk about all the issues that may be uh, in the foreign policy realm and uh, do a much better job than, than I would do. So I would ask you only to reserve judgment on some of those questions until those who seek to hold the highest 
office of this country and to deal with those issues uh, can respond to them. Yes, sir. Mr. Kirk, um, will the Democratic Party in 1988 have a industrial strategy for economic renewal uh, that stands in marked contrast to the policies of Reaganomics and go beyond merely calls for budget uh, re reduction, uh, deficit reductions and, and uh, trade protections? Yes, I'm not sure that it'll be called an industrial policy as such. Uh, there are those who said even that that's the use of those words has not quite worked out. But I, there are many people who are now uh, working on what they think would be absolutely essential in terms of, I mentioned for just the role of the public sector and the private sector, the business side of the aisle, the role of labor and management, and the uh, role of government in trying to help us as a, uh, as a society going through the shifts between industrial to informational to technological to work it out on almost a partnership basis. Uh, not with uh, a big brother approach or trying to solve all the problems with big dollars, but trying to get the kind of preliminary homework and uh, charting a course that makes sense and that isn't a budget buster and that makes a, makes a difference even in uh, as we watch the demographical shifts from industrial belts to other belts in the country. Uh, not so much to say, look it, we're going to pick winners and losers, but to try to work with all of those areas and try to really make us what we've always been, I think, a stronger base and a production country and a, and a country that can serve not only our own people but uh, other peoples around the globe. That, that's the kind of work that the party has challenged itself on and some of our folks are, are working hard on at this moment. Yes, ma'am. You probably answered my question uh, in answering the young man up there, so uh, probably instead of asking a question, I'll just uh, put it in a statement. Uh, the so-called uh, experts around Harvard and uh, MIT say the next uh, world war will begin in the Middle East and will be a nuclear war. Uh, George Ball says that the United States has no policy in the Middle East. Uh, so I should like to see the Democratic Party have, make plans to have a sensible, viable policy in the Middle East and uh, prevent us from being embroiled in a nuclear third world war. Thank you very much. I don't think there's uh, many people who doubt the need for a fashioning and shaping and committing ourselves to a policy that will stabilize the problems in the Middle East. And I don't uh, believe, from my own point of view, that our party could possibly go to uh, the American people and ask for support or to, uh, to the world as, a, as the uh, oldest party in, uh, in the free world without really having a clear, forthright policy that can stabilize that area of the country. I appreciate your comment very much. Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Chairman, tax reform seems to be a kind of political football that's been passed from one player to another over the last recent years. First, we had Bradley Gephardt, Treasury 1, Treasury 2, and now it seems to be lying in the hands of Mr. Rostenkowski at Ways and Means. Is this an issue um, that can help the Democrats, or by virtue of the fact that no matter what kind of bill is passed, there are going to be many interests that are offended or upset, an issue that the Democrats should stay away from? Uh, <clears throat> my own belief is that at the moment, obviously, there are discussions within the Ways and Means Committee and in the Democratic side of the Congress about that very question. I, it was initially a Democratic initiative. Uh, President Reagan, Reagan seized that initiative and changed the subject and went to the country, and then Rosti came and said, write to me. and. Uh, they, clearly, if you're going to do anything on taxes, it's got to be some sort of a bipartisan effort. I think most people are somewhat mystified, given the fact that there are the budget deficits and all the things that need to be done, that you have a Republican president who really was elected by a landslide, you have a Republican Senate, and you go to the country with a revenue-neutral package. I think most people, whether they understand new math or old math, wonder what the hell is going on here. Uh, the, uh, on the political side of it, I think uh, most people would argue that if there are any two cards left in the Reagan administration uh, package for this uh, second administration, one is tax reform and the other is, as we all pray, that he'll be successful with the summit meeting. Uh, on the tax reform issue, I don't believe uh, 
that we'll probably get a tax bill this year, and I think it's less likely when you uh, talk about a tax bill in 1986, even though it is uh, purportedly revenue neutral. I think the more people that uh, paid attention to the bill, the more uh, skeptical they became about its fairness. I think uh, Congressman Roskomkowski is doing all that he can to try to ensure that there is an equitable package and is uh, probably prepared to walk as far as he can without giving the uh, president the total support and walking away from the Democratic position on it. But uh, I would expect that the answer to your question will be seen with, uh, relatively soon, perhaps within the next couple of weeks. John. As an old uh, acquaintance, um, I've known you since the days when Harry Truman was president, though I haven't seen very much of you in recent years. Uh, I've followed your career with great interest. I think you have great potential. You've done a lot of good already, and I think you're going to make quite a turnaround in the Democratic Party. And an office tends to uh, evolve with the occupant, and so in the past, uh, uh, party chairmen have tended to be involved with the nuts and bolts, organizational matters, fairness, and I think fairness and hard work are where you're going to make some very important contributions. But to the extent that there's a vacuum in the leadership and to the extent that it is hard for the members of the opposition party to get the attention of the press, you know, uh, they call the presidency a bully pulpit and the Democrats don't have anybody in the White House at the moment, so you may be called on. The people in the audience are asking you questions about issues and I think you have the ability. I wouldn't be surprised possibly to see you someday in in high national office, but I think maybe, <laughs> uh, maybe you're going to have to be ready to answer some of those issues questions, even though it isn't traditional in the party chairman. And uh, if I could mention a few of the things that I think have perhaps uh, hurt the party in some of the recent elections, you could think about how you might handle them in the future. Uh, one issue, there's the image, you know, that they do cartoons of Tip O'Neill. I think he's a great guy, but, but the Republicans do the cartoons of Tip O'Neill. Now, there was a story on, uh, on Tip O'Neill, a cover story in U.S. News, and there he was with a cigar. And I, we read a story about Walter Mondale last June, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, Time cover story, and it says, it says uh, he, he smokes cigars in private, though not in public. And there's an article in the Boston Globe on July 25th of this year about Senator Kennedy uh, in a Senate hearing, and he's smoking a cigar, the Globe says. <laughs> now, I happen to... Do you want to know whether I smoke cigars, John? No, no, no. <laughs> but I believe this is one of the most important issues facing the American uh, public because one, one out of six Americans accelerates his or her death with, uh, with smoking, an average of seven years for the pack-a-day smoker. And we're all talking about the high cost of health care. They say 30% of hospitalization is smoking related. So I say the personal example is important. And I don't want to embarrass those gentlemen, but I say here is an opportunity to, for leadership to benefit the people and uh, improve the image of the party. And that's the type of issue uh, that I'm concerned with. And, well, I will ask you, uh, can you, can you be responsive on these issues? Can you perhaps get a few of the people like Les Aspen? The, the, public, the public wants uh, action on disarmament, and, you, uh, and the House of Representatives elects a Senate committee who seems to give in to the, uh, the military-industrial complex all the time. Can you, as chairman, uh, and being young and articulate, can you get to some of these old-timers? Yes. Excuse Thank me. you, John. Uh, excuse, huh? me. excuse me, over here. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Kirk, uh, it's said that you can't beat a horse with no horse, and after listening to you tonight, it seems to me, at least on the national level, uh, the Democratic Party has no horse. Uh, what is your political co coalition that you plan to put together to replace the coalition of FDR that seems to me is, uh, is now totally disintegrated, most of it being in the, the uh, Republican Party, the Southern uh, white uh, Democrats now being very staunch Reaganites, and many of the ethnic uh, Catholics in the uh, the North have become middle class now being uh, in the Republican Party the last uh, two elections. What's the coalition you plan to put together to regain the White House in 1988? Well, I think the uh, the folks that you mentioned that supported uh, Ronald Reagan. When you think of 49 states out of 50. Uh, you're talking about a lot of people and 
almost uh, every region of the country except one state. Uh, I don't look at that as the absolute destruction of the old coalition. I think there are a lot of things that people, there have been trends that people have left our party over the last few years. I've said uh, before that more than anything else, what we have to do is work together prior to getting the party a horse and that's the nominee and the ticket in 1988, and that that ticket and the party collectively have to reclaim its own rightful heritage. And we have to do, in, in the coalition, we have to, I think, uh, not only hold our old allies, but appeal to the new constituencies in this country. We have to not divorce ourselves from our old principles, but we have to be able to experiment and have new experiences and a new vision. And if we live up to the heritage and work together in the meantime and not turn our back on the minorities of this country, because I don't think we'll probably deserve to be a majority party if we do, and we're responsive to them, and we're talking about issues that affect economic security and families and jobs and providing education in a way that people feel secure about it, and not, as I feel that a lot of people feel today, we may be on a collision course with the future, then I think people in all regions of the country will respond to that kind of a message. And that's some of the work we're beginning during these early months. The first things that I mentioned early on were to try to get our internal house in order. The intellectual exercise that the officials and others at the party's table is beginning. It's not as if we're going to turn everything around overnight. In politics, it's hard, slow, deliberate work. But after, and I think we will, as I said earlier, win back the 1986 Senate and start the momentum to the next two years. And if we have a fair and open process and try to impose some discipline on the debates of 1988 and nominate someone who can respond to some of the things that you articulated, then I think the old coalitions will come back. Most of those people still want to be Democrats but they've been disappointed in the image and some of the perceptions of the party. But more than anything else, I think people are like they were when I was a kid. They want to look up and look to the future. And that's uh, the challenge of our party. We have to live up to what we've always been. And the, uh, the one who will finally carry that baton, or the two, will be the people we nominate in 1988. And we not only nominate somebody who could win for the Democratic Party, but maintain the trust and confidence of, of the people who they represent. Um, 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 Good exposition, good advocacy. Thank you very much, Paul Kirk, and thank all of you, the audience.